All right, so we thank the uh, Libertarian candidates for governor for joining the Tony Hernandez show. And with that, we're going to bring on our next guest. His name is Mr. Anthony Meshke, and he's running for the Minnesota State House of Representatives. Anthony. Hey, Tony. Thanks, Thanks for, for uh, coming on. Does anyone ever call you Tony, or has it always been Anthony? Uh, it's usually been Anthony, so. I tried to change my name to Anthony. Well, it's <laughs> legally Anthony, but everyone called me Tony from birth, but uh, I actually like Anthony and prefer that name, but it never really caught on for me, so. Well, I'm nowhere close to that. I'm with Jeff. I don't have Anthony as my middle name. Hey, I called right? you Jeffrey at the intro. You did? So, you know. So anyways, Anthony, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. You're running for the Minnesota State House of Representatives. We had uh, one of your uh, competitors, I should say, uh, Miss Lena Bugs on last week. Uh, she actually had nothing but great things to say about you. She said you're young, you're energetic, that you're getting out there. And, uh, you know, she actually said that you guys share some of the same values and some of the issues as well. But can you tell everybody how your uh, campaign is going so far? Yeah, it's going very well so far. We're getting out there. Uh, we're trying to educate, you know, voters on how the government's infringing on their rights right now and telling them what they can and can't do in their own house. Um, talked to Lena Bugs quite a few times, seen her out door knocking. I mean, she is really getting out there and informing the voters also. She's, she's giving them another option. Um, she doesn't think either party has all the options, and I don't think either party has all the options also, you know. There's a lot of things that I agree with on the Republican Party and a lot of things I agree with, or not a lot of things, but there's things that I agree with with the Green Party mm -hmm. and the Democrat Party. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's there's one thing that unites Republicans with, with all the third parties if you live in St. Paul, and that's, that's you know, you, you, you're you basically going up against the machine. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I've ran a, a ca campaign in St. Paul, and it, it absolutely is uh, a, the, 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 a machine, and... You know, uh, Representative Rena Moran, who's your opponent, um, she's part of the machine. Um, I have met her one time. She seems like a nice enough person. But can you tell uh, us a little bit about uh, what it is about Rena's record um, that you would uh, do differently if you're elected? Yeah, um, first thing, Viking Stadium. I mean, she voted for the Viking Stadium. And, uh, well, let me uh, flip through this paper. So Rena, she voted for the, the Viking Stadium? She vo Rena voted for the Viking Stadium. I got the bill numbers here for all the stuff. Mm -hmm. HF 2958. Um, she voted for government pay raises. That was SF 1952. Um, she voted to eliminate part-time police officers. So she got rid of the... Um, licenses for part-time police officers. I mean, that's not one thing that the state should be mandating. That's up to the individual u or cities and individual departments for who they should be employing. Why do you think she she b voted for that? Was there um, a I'd say or? unions are probably um, a big thing. If you go on her, Rena Moran's endorsement page, I mean, almost all of them are unions. You know, big unions, big money, mm -hmm. big givers, that's who that's who they're supporting. Mm -hmm. And uh, payback with the child care, she voted for the child care unionization. Um, which I don't support. My mom does daycare right now for the last 30 years. And the amount of paperwork and infringement that they're uh, putting my mom through, I mean, it's just crazy. It, th she's focusing more on paperwork than she can on her kids now. It's just crazy. You know, one, one thing that strikes me, if you remember the anti-bullying debate that mm -hmm. took place in mm -hmm. the state house, it was last spring. I don't remember it was exactly, but this debate went on into the wee hours of the night. Yes, and I remember did. that uh, uh, Rena Moran, your opponent, she stood up and she gave a speech and she was speaking about all the concerns she had against this anti-bullying legislation. And people from your district were telling her, I don't think you should vote for this because this could be used against minorities. This could be yep. used to uh, basically entrap people and label them as bullies and ruin their records. And, and that's the last thing we need to do to our youth right now is to give them more lifelong glitches on their records that's yep. going to hinder them from getting jobs and all that. So she gave this impassioned speech about all these concerns with this flawed legislation, but then she ended it stating, well, I'm going to vote for it anyways. And I watched this, and I was just like, "Wow, you know who? You, you, you know, you mentioned the unions that may be one of the the strong uh, influences in yep. their voting behaviors." But well, we're trying to get they're trying to get the decisions to the bigger now. The states making decisions on what the individual schools have to punish mm -hmm. and what they're doing. I mean, who's to say bull bullying in one school isn't is not bullying in another school? You know, it's different between different schools and we're removing that from the teachers, from the parents, from the school boards and we're putting it to some bureaucrats at the state level or at Washington DC even. Mm -hmm. So what would you do different if you're in St. Paul, the Capitol building? Do different? I mean you have to vote on print like Rena Moran said she was uh, she was against the bill or constituents I mean and then she voted for it anyways so w 
where does where's that disconnect going? And I mean, we need to stop spending money on Senate office buildings. It's ninety million. It's over a million dollars per office. We need to stop spending money on Viking Stadium, which is corporate welfare. Um, light rail. We spent sixteen thousand dollars per foot. We have the light rail now. I think we should be using it. There's still buses going there. There's still now they're putting in another bus line that's an express bus line from St. Paul to Minneapolis. And I mean, let's start pushing everyone towards light rail and using it more. So it's changes like that. And you mentioned that uh, that Representative Moran that she voted for the Viking Stadium, which uh, you know Governor Dayton labeled as the People Stadium, and that yeah. there's the whole debacle with the e pull tabs, the way they were going to fund it. It didn't it didn't happen the way that they planned, so they had to add the uh, the tax on tobacco, which gave an enormous increase to uh, cigarettes and and, mm -hmm. and and such. But um, well, if we expect government to be doing what they're saying, you know, any program, all the um, wasted money out there right now, and they're never following through. And then now they're putting sin taxes on things. We're letting government dictate what is a sin and what's moral. I mean, that's, government shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's society's role to say tobacco is bad, to say alcohol is bad. And with that, we're giving government the ability to close private businesses on certain days of the week. On a holy day, they're closing businesses. You know, you can't buy alcohol, you can't buy cars on Sunday. I mean, when we start giving the government the ability to close businesses and tell them when they can and cannot be open, they're forcing bars to be closed at 2 a.m. I mean, that's a statewide mandate. There's no, the state shouldn't be putting the same regulations on a bar in Duluth as in Brainerd. It should be a local, get government down to local level. Mm -hmm. So going back to the, the Viking Stadium, oh, yeah. uh, Governor Dayton said that uh, the Vikings held Minnesota hostage, yeah. and basically that was the point of negotiation, that if we didn't mm -hmm. build them a stadium, they would have left. If you're Representative Meshke back during when that debate was taken, taking part, would yep. you have uh, given in and voted for the stadium, or would you have left, the, uh, told the Vikings either you guys fund it, or if you want to leave, that's fine. Yeah, I would have called their bluff. You know, it's going to cost them a lot of money to go somewhere else, and I mean they had they had a stadium right there, and all they were doing was getting a push for the Super Bowl, I believe, and now they're bringing everything else. The state is paying a lot of money for the Super Bowl. It, I only read a certain snippets of this NFL contract that they have. 56 page contract. Is it? Yeah. So, I mean, there's no way there are people are, well, the government's voting on bills that they haven't even read themselves. So that's what I would like to get back to is making the bills short, concise, focusing on the one issue, get rid of all the uh, like earmark spending and things like that and adders onto the bill. Um, but back to the Viking Stadium. So they're putting in exemptions for that Sunday. So they, they're trying to pass a law so you can sell liquor on Sunday during the Super Bowl Sunday. So, you know, we're, we're giving the government the ability to do that, which isn't right. Well, wow. now, as I had asked the previous guests, what's your background and what made you decide that you wanted to run for rep? You yeah. know, just wake up one morning and say, you know what, I think I'm just going to run for office. I mean, you're a young guy, right? You're young 26, guy. 26, 27 years old. And yeah, I'm 26 years old. Not a whole lot of, you know, young people are that involved or even, you know, we mentioned off, off air is that 60% of people or, or something of the sort don't even know there's an election. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right that's now. what I talk to people like, oh, what district are you in? Like, oh, I don't know. I, I voted for Ron Paul last time. What does that mean? It's like, all right, well, it means you're in Minnesota. You're in Minnesota. So, um people my age, I work with them my age, and, you know, I'm bringing up all these discussions on politics, and, you know, they, they don't know about it, so I'm trying to educate people. And um, the reason I got into this, I would say daughter was born, and I just saw how the hospital was trying to force all these immunizations on us, and then going to daycare, and uh, all the regulations. They're asking us how much we're making at daycare. We, you know, we signed an agreement with the daycare, we're going to pay you this much a month to watch after a kid. Now, like, you need to tell us this, you need to get this paper signed, you need to get these shots for your kids. I look into every shot that they were trying to give Me her. Too. Yeah, I looked into Not every shot. daughter, but my son. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I looked into everyone, and it's like, um, no, my daughter does not need these. So I looked into the reason for CDC's trying to get it, and I decided not to get them for my daughter. And I'm glad I didn't, because now looking at the CDC whistleblower that just came out, autism is linked to the MMR vaccine, and there's mercury. And, I mean, they say all these things, heavy metals, are in these injections, and they're still forcing them on our kids. Hmm. So it gets me very... I've talked to a lot of people, and I talk to them, and they're like, oh, my daughter has autism, and I think it came from after she got all these vaccines. I didn't give it to my other kids, and they don't have autism. So I'll, n people are not talking about this, and it is a huge thing. We've had people from the CDC come out and say, we skewed the data, we got rid of all this, so it doesn't look like it causes it. Mm. 
Well, Governor Dayton just came out, and I think I, I actually heard it on the radio when I was driving in here today uh, about proclaiming certain hospitals as hospitals of excellence, I believe the term was, uh, essentially meaning that these are the hospitals in this state where Ebola patients can go. Yeah. Your thoughts about that whole situation, you know, as we're dealing with Ebola as a possible national crisis, we haven't had any cases here in this state yet, yeah. but your thoughts as far as, you know, the, um, you know, the licensing of hospitals, the treatment of, of patients here, and government's involvement in all of that. Well, let's look at how government's dealt with Ebola so far. They haven't shut down any of the borders, which... I don't think government should be regulating too much of that anyways. We should be pushing the airlines who are bringing people. That's a private business. You know, we should be pushing the stewardesses to, you know, uh, stop going on those flights and stop taking them. And uh, as far as the patients, I mean, we're bringing people from Africa here with Ebola, and that's not right either. Um, government is in bed with these big hospitals. I mean, we're just letting government get into every aspect, and yet CDC is getting, what, $6 billion? 6.6 .6 billion or billion a year. I mean, what are they doing with that money? They aren't doing anything for Ebola. They don't have any immunizations for it or uh, those the MZAP or whatever it is. The people took it and 50% of them lived because of that. But I don't know what the CDC is doing. They're spending all this money. It's all our money, taxpayer money. It's everyone's money, and they're wasting it. Mm -hmm. So what are the big issues? Um, have you done a lot of door knocking in your district? And then yeah, can, can you tell everyone where your district is too? So my district is St. Paul, um, so Maryland Avenue, and okay. then so that's on the north end. Then. Yep, Maryland Avenue, Rice Street is the eastern border, uh, kind of goes Snelling, Pierce Butler up to Dale Street, and then uh, both Summit, it goes a little south of Summit, mm -hmm. it kind of jogs around there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's my district, and some of the bigger, or you had a first part of your question? Uh, have you done a lot of door knocking? Door knocking, yep. Um, I haven't went out and actually knocked on a lot of doors, I've walked around the neighborhoods, and I don't let I have a hard time knocking on people's doors. It's, I feel like I'm an, I don't like when people knock on my door. So I go around, if I see somebody outside, I'll go talk to them. I've been going to the farmer's markets and uh, the Mekong night out. I was there to like 1130 talking to people. Everyone's very receptive, um, talking about crime in the area. Crime's a huge thing. The police are out there. I see them every day when I come home from work. They're out there trying to catch speeders going five, 10 miles over the speed limit. And what's that? That's revenue generation for mm -hmm. the cities. I mean, instead, they should be out there walking the beat. Get out of your car. And you can't hear or see anything in the car. Um, so get out of the car, start protecting people, start putting a presence on the street. I've walked uh, Western Avenue at 11.30 at night on a Saturday. Didn't see a single car. I walked all the way from University to my house, which is almost by Maryland. And so, so where are you going to walk tonight? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see. So um, I will have to see what's going on. So there's a few events and I'll have to decide on that. My village, I like going down there, so really nice place to eat and hang out. But um, yeah, getting the cops back to that, focused on crimes that have victims. You know, we're, we're focusing on victimless crimes, the war on drugs, failed policy. What's that doing? It's splitting up families, it's perpetuating the cycle then. So I think we should stop putting people in jail for not, they aren't hurting anyone. And then I think you talked about earlier with the bullying bill, we're putting this, uh, this mark on their record. So we're making felons out of these young people, and that's stuck on their record, it hinders them from getting jobs in the future. It hinder a lot of them can't vote. I mean, their gun, their right to self-defense is taken away. So a lot of things that they didn't hurt anyone, and yet the government's labeled them as this horrible person. So you, you, your district's a, a very diverse district, oh, yeah. uh, multicultural, and in, you know we've brought this issue up on the show many, many times about uh, the issues facing minorities in Minnesota, mm -hmm. um, the achievement gap. Uh, people of color, students of color graduate at some of the worst rates in the country compared to other uh, white counterparts, and then also home ownership rates are down. And then if you even look at the disparity of unemployment numbers uh, between uh, minorities and uh, Caucasians here in Minnesota, you'll see a pretty substantial difference. And do you have any ideas as to how to improve education? for uh, minorities and then also how to improve uh, job prospects. Yeah, I think um, a lot of the education comes back to parent involvement and we're removing parents from the schools. We're giving Washington DC the ability to tell our schools what they need to be teaching, what tests these students need to be passing. I mean, it should be up to the school boards, it should be up to the teachers and up to the parents. Um, Marina Moran, she's just, there was a bill that came up and in it was allowing schools the ability to hire and fire teachers based on performance. She voted against that. So that's removing the ability to employ 
teachers based on their drive and their motivation and uh, their willingness to teach the kids. We need to, uh, I don't think race should be the big determining factor on the kids that, on the schools that we're giving money to or whatnot. We should be instead focusing on how each student learns. You know, giving the teachers the ability to, um, <clears throat> give teachers the ability to see how a student's learning, if he learns better visually or audi audi or auditor Audi, what's the word I'm looking for? Auditorily. <laughs> Auditorily? Okay, yeah. I just made up a word, I think, but sorry about that. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different learn ways to learn, and mm -hmm. uh, instead, of, instead of having them focus on a test that the state, I mean, all we're doing is preparing them for this test. We aren't mm -hmm. preparing them for real life or preparing them to get into college. Mm -hmm. You know, if everyone's going through college, which is state mandated or state paid for, everything like that, everyone has the same education, we get out, and now we all have the same unemployment. Now we just all have college degrees that aren't doing anything for us. Well, right. speaking of uh, unemployment and minorities and you know the economy, last week when we had uh, was it Lena Bugs, mm -hmm. your other opponent on on the show, you know she and I got into a little bit of a, a debate discussion on the minimum wage, and so I just want to turn that over to you. What you know she advocates a fifteen dollar living wage. What's your thoughts yeah. on the min on the minimum wage argument? I'd like to hear the definition of living wage. You know, someone might want a Ferrari and eat shrimp every night and live in a 3,000 square foot mansion, and somebody might want to live in a commune and grow their own vegetables, and they might, might want to ride a bike to work. I mean, should they both be forced to make the same amount of money if some guy's happy walking next door and gardening all day for $3 an hour and he can live on that, that's fine. Or if somebody, you know, they're out there uh, trying to make $30, $40 an hour, I mean, cost of living is different for everyone. And for the government to dictate that $15 is cost of living for someone, I don't think that's right. Um, we should let the employer and the employee make the decision on what that contract should say. Um, so no minimum wage at all? No, I don't think there should be a minimum wage because unless someone's forcing you to go to work, which would be slavery, I mean, there's always a choice there. Um, I don't think, you don't have a right to have a job outside your front door. I mean, you might have to move to find your job. Government can't put a job at your door. That's not where the employers are, and it, that's, the employees might have to travel somewhere. I mean, it's horrible. That's what our grandparents did, our great-grandparents did. I mean, it is a lot of work, but we're working to, you know, for our kids, and we shouldn't be taking money from someone else for that. We should be doing it on our own. So, uh, one, quickly, you're, you're coming to the end of the time yeah. here, but I wanted to, we're going to play your uh, Anthony Meschke for weed video oh, that okay. I saw on <laughs> Facebook, but uh, can you, do you agree with uh, the law that was recently passed that legalized uh, one manufacturer to make uh, THC oil for a very specific type of patients? Would you have voted for that? If, if not, what, what type of policy would you support? So I would support full legalization. Government shouldn't be dictating morals or syntax. So like Colorado? Colorado, yeah, that's fine. I mean, if somebody's doing drugs in their own house, they aren't hurting anyone. So if someone's going out and hitting someone upside the back of the head and stealing their money or anything like that, that's a crime, and that should be punished as such. So put, you know, putting people in jail for victimless crimes, like we said earlier. Um, I would, the bill, you know, that's giving government the ability to pick and choose winners pick and choose winners and losers, and a uh, cylinder comes to mind with the solar company. I mean, government isn't the smartest per person out there. The economy is made up of me, you, and you and everyone else out there. We're sales between those people. That's who's deciding who's winning and losing. One thing I'd, I'd push back a little bit on, right. and I'm not necessarily disagreeing on, on your position, but, you know, somebody doing drugs at home could be hurting somebody, you know, like if they have children or, or, or other people. Yeah, and know, if they and, are, that's a crime. Right, and, and then I guess I just wanted yep. to, to make that distinguishment because even alcohol is legal but yep. people abuse it and they hurt other people yeah, child like abuse 70 percent of all crimes are committed by somebody with a, a with alcohol in their system trace amounts or they're uh, intoxicated but yep. um, and we should be punishing that person and you know not the alcohol it's mm -hmm. the person made that decision whether they're inebriated or not and so you're not endorsing I irresponsible behavior no, you're, you're endorsing i don't freedom. do drugs i won't i don't have a desire to do drugs um, my company private company tests drugs for everyone like that works there and uh, I tell my fr I don't want my friends doing that I don't want to hang out with people that do that but it doesn't mean that I'm going to limit people from having the choices to do that okay so you got the next 15 minutes uh, or 15 seconds Anthony <laughs> uh, just can you tell everyone your website and how to get a hold of you yeah go to anthony4mn.com f-o-r-m-n.com uh, look me up on twitter or anything like that send me an email give me a call I mean I want to be open uh, 
give people the option to ask me questions. Sounds good. Anthony Meschke, thank you for uh, right. coming on the show. Good luck with the race. Yes, thank you. Good luck. Dallas, if we can pop this up, we're just going to play his video while we bring in the next guest. or fraud. If someone wants to grow, buy, or sell a natural product without force or coercion, the government should have no authority to interfere. Drug prohibition is a failed policy and has cost the taxpayer almost one trillion dollars. The war on drugs has eroded our civil liberties and bill of rights with warrantless NSA spying and no-knock raids. This has distracted our police from protecting people and instead focuses the police on enforcing the state's moral codes. The prisons are full of people who have committed victimless crimes, and the drug war is breaking up families who have not hurt anyone. When we let the government dictate what we can and cannot consume, we give them the power over our lives. If you believe in freedom, you'll support people's right to make any decision that does not harm others. If a crime has a victim, it should be punished. If there is no victim, it should not be a crime. I hope you will support my campaign and take a look at my website, anthony4mn.com, anthonyformn.com. So I think uh, Anthony Meschke might be the only one to have a campaign sign with, with weed on it. But uh, uh, yeah. 20 years ago, I never thought I would actually see a sign with that on it. 